thank you, Paul. And thanks, everybody, again, for coming out. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the consortium, right? So Paul gave an intro about how I got started um, and, and kind of the mission, if you will, right? So I'll touch a little bit more detail for those. We have today is the public day, right? So we make a little assumption that everyone's familiar with the initiative and what we're trying to do. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on a few of those points. <coughs> And then do we have a clicker for slide editing here? Or not? I'm not averse to talking about this. Okay, thank you. Right, so uh, for those of you here yesterday, I apologize. Uh, there will be a couple repeat slides, but I want to touch on um, a couple big points, right? Some of the driving motivations. When we think about industrial robotics, historically, right, they've, they've really been really good at a few things. Right? And we tend to think of like these really large installations uh, that sort of are associated, or very commonly associated with the automotive industry. And, and they've gotten really good at moving parts around. You can actually see uh, the trend from, I think, the 1993 in this data through 2017. They've actually even gotten better as a, as a percent of total sales. The trends relative to being applied to material handling have been going up, whereas before, obviously, the sweet spot was material cleaning. Obviously, these are still today the lion's share of what people are doing with industrial robotics. In fact, what's sort of shocking is, is that we've really even seen a decline in the percent of total sales with the increase of what we've been doing in the material handling space, and some of that's with the advancements in machine vision. But we're actually seeing a, a decrease in sort of these other applications, right? Why aren't robotics, why aren't industrial robotics doing these more of like a diverse set of tasks in factories, right? What is the hang up? Is there just not the value case? Is it a limited functionality? Right, so where I came from at Caterpillar, right, we had a real diverse set of challenges. Right, we weren't necessarily making a bunch of similar looking vehicles. We weren't necessarily just welding very similar welding joints. Right, we had a lot of different challenges, a real wide, wide array of tasks that really could be applied to, robotics could be applied to, but the variation, the dynamism, and the mix really presented a lot of different challenges. So as, as Paul alluded to about the Institute's journey, right, Similarly, right, we've been very excited about the advancements and developments around the robot operating system ROC, and now ROC 2. And typically when we deal with like audiences or have come from the industrial realm, look much like myself, is we have there is usually a little bit of a learning curve to get familiar with, right? So there's been a lot of advancements and a lot of engagement, contributions towards ROC and the open source community more broadly, but this sort of mode of operation has been sort of foreign if you really cut the teeth in an industrial floor. Right, so really what we try to do is like, hey, it's sort of a framework, right, in an ecosystem or a middleware or it acts like that, but it's more, right? So we typically represent it with this graphic. Obviously our friends uh, at Open Robotics um, have variations of this graphic as well, uh, but really it sums it up. And I think what's really different, particularly when you come from the industrial realm, historically if I had a problem, where was I going? Right, I was going to the company that sold me the robot, like, hey, this thing isn't working, I'm having an issue, uh, the vision system's not giving me the output that I need, and that, that was basically my only recourse. What's really unique when we start talking about working within an open source community and actually building out the core building blocks of, of the functionality to enable me to do something different, I now have this ecosystem. The ecosystem is basically a diverse set of individuals who are all using these different building blocks in different ways, who have basically done a certain level of means testing, or ideally now, as we work as a global open source project in the industrial sense, is that we're actually doing means testing that's very relevant to our end use cases. And this is really what's different from those of us who've come from the industrial side of things. And that's really exciting. <clears throat> so I always want to clarify, right? So we were um, at an A3 forum a couple of years ago, I was with Sean Edwards, and someone pointed out, you guys have some really great marketing. I was in there and someone asked me, oh, are, do you, are you built on Ross Industrial? And they're like, well, no, we're built on ROS and it's the same thing. And they're like, but is it industrial? And so since then, I've really, really taken the point to drive home that ROS industrial is ROS, right? The only thing that's different about our open source project is that we're trying to extend ROS and now ROS 2 to basically industrial relevant hardware, right? So the manipulators are usually the stars sometimes in this show. Uh, and of course, industrial relevant uh, applications as well as bridges for different industrial let's just say in certain cases, proprietary buses and protocols. That's really where we shine, right? So it's a lot of the interoperability with the industrial rela relevant hardware and communication buses. Uh, and of course, obviously, extending it to those real applications uh, with the requirements and really thinking about the robustness and reliability 
uh, industrial end users expect. <clears throat> so as Paul alluded to, right, and we're happy to talk about, is our community has really grown. Um, in, in more recent years, we've both seen a grow in tech companies. So you'll see names like uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, Microsoft, Intel, uh, ARM, as well as like collaborative uh, with other consortia. So for instance, the Steel Founders Association of America and the ARM Institute um, and organizations such as that. That only makes the, the efforts and what we're trying to do together uh, more successful, right? So bringing together large tech, um, enabling this project to be sort of a conduit or a, a means to, hey, how do we most effectively collaborate with industry to meet their needs? As opposed to in the past, perhaps, trying to point by point work with each industrial end user and maybe almost getting a fire hose to the face. We hope our initiative here is a way to enable tech and industry to collaborate a little bit more effectively. At least that's, that's the goal. <clears throat> with that said, our members are actually providing a lot of input to drive our direction. A little bit as Paul alluded to when he first got started and my predecessors have communicated here, there's a lot of things we can work on, right? But what do we work on? So we're constantly working with the consortium to get the feedback to make sure we're focusing our efforts on the right places. <clears throat> and that says here, um, a lot of it where I'm gonna talk about in the coming days and particularly my, my little bit of time tomorrow okay. is a little bit around particularly ease of use. But we'll talk about that. And with our broader goals of quality, improved user experience, and of course, obviously, the capability. <clears throat> One of the things I beat on, I touched on this yesterday, so I apologize, are these use cases that are very relevant to industry. So like, hey, how do you drive the value proposition for investing in a system with this type of capability? And this harkens back to my time at Caterpillar when I had to like, get a dime out of anybody. I had to have an ROI ready to go. So in this particular instance, right, we're talking about multiple sites. Uh, some sites do not have enough capacity. They're going to go out and buy more equipment, but there's sites next door within the same company that have idle equipment laying around. How do we more effectively enable agility in these deployed systems to do more, right? Ross actually provides the means to do that, right? When we talk about perception and autonomous path planning, these are sort of those building blocks to realize that agility to get more return out of your investments. The other thing that people don't always think about is the existing legacy paradigm for industrial automation still has costs associated with it. Right? We're asking manufacturing engineers and a lot of plants to actually play the role as robotic technicians, right? or even like in certain cases, the software engineers, right? depending on the problems they're encountering. Right? So we can't forget that like, that whole pipeline requires has a cost associated with it. And finally, right, one of the dirty secrets, at least in certain facilities and certain operations, is that really we've, done, we've had really great successes, like I touched on in my first slide, like say in this case I'm talking about materials joining, but we've just shuffled a lot of the costs around in context of our variable labor. Right, so we make more capable systems. If we can manage the dynamism and the variation, we can actually attack a broader cost across our value stream, not just at the operation we're trying to automate. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, we want to talk about, again, and I touched on this, is this direction, enable investment to accelerate development, uh, education, right? And this is actually a picture from a recent training we did at Glidewell Laboratories. So thank you, uh, Glidewell, for supporting that training and for all of you who made that training event. But this idea of basically leveraging the feedback from the membership to make sure we're providing training that is both impactful and relevant. Um, and ideally, right, as we engage with our different universities, all the membership that realizes the benefits of an efficient pipeline. I know as I'm reviewing resumes from my organization, it's very powerful to see that um, more and more often, even mechanical engineers that has Ross on their resume. Right? And when I was at Caterpillar, that, that never happened. And we were kind of bootstrapping and growing material science <laughs> degree people. I had a, a master's degree in physics. We were bootstrapping. Hey, go through this Ross training. Don't worry. We'll, 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 we'll let you crawl before you can walk and walk before you can run. Uh, but now we're getting kids right out of bachelor's programs uh, ready to go and make a difference. And obviously, Paul touched on the global impact. One of the things we're very excited about, and I, I want to touch on. Oops. Sorry, give us one second. One sec. That's me. Let's keep going. <laughs> Um, one of the things I want to touch on is, again, I touched on a little bit about ease of use. So one of the areas we've been able to address recently is ease of use for basically the people who work on the floor. And this right here you're seeing is an interface, sorry, my video is paused, uh, is an interface for basically a manufacturing engineer. So again, as I mentioned in plants, manufacturing engineers are playing these multi-roles. Historically, when they're doing this sort of application setup, this is a point-by-point -point or on teach pendant, maybe they're using something like Robot Studio. But they're still typically doing a lot of interacting to generate the waypoint. 
here, they're actually just entering the detail that they need specific to their process, and it's applying all their process tasks. Boom, and it's saved. They can recall it on the shop floor live as that part's presented, and then run it in an online plan. Levi's going to touch a little bit more on this sort of capability. The exciting news is that actually this is a, this particular setup is now running in a in a shop uh, down in Georgia. So we're very excited to see the progress here. And of course, I don't think I can play two videos at once. I apologize. Yeah, that video is conked out. But anyways, it goes and, and uh, scrubs on the part. So we we like this video because we're actually contacting the part right within the compliance of that particular tool. Right. So we're doing localization, all the path planning accurately enough that we can actually do controlled processes on production parts. This is actually a remanufacturing part, but it's still remanufacturing is also tons of variation, right? When we talk about field return products. <clears throat> so, oh, this formatting came out a little goofy. Apologize. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is again, we're, we're trying to give value to the end users through effective collaboration. You know, thank you to the ARM Institute I mentioned before, and of, and of course uh, the Steel Founders Association of America, but also like this, I highlight this project as a collaboration with NIST that now actually has follow-on funding from the ARM Institute in collaboration with Siemens and RTI. And this is all about making more efficient interoperability across the assets in your value stream. Right? So historically, this group, we talk mostly about robots. But a lot of times, if you have a robot, you also have other machines and pieces of equipment in your factory you need to interact with. Right? So let's, let's come up with the right standards, the frameworks, the tools, make sure other open standards can interact with our robotic systems efficiently, right? and we can make a broader impact. So these sort of collaborations, this was work, uh, again, funded by NIST, that's now on a follow-on project with the ARM Institute with Siemens. <clears throat> again, I, I, I touch on it, right? I, I gave the example of the manufacturing engineering application, but obviously, as we talk about the improved user experience, we're continually trying to evolve the training based on your feedback. So one of the things we did recently was the first ROS2 training. Uh, it, was, it was an advanced topic. We're seriously considering uh, accelerating the creation of a full ROS2 training set for industrial uses where we can do path planning and, and the full tilt of things we currently do, uh, particularly with the recent announcement of MoveIt2. Right? So we basically have all the pieces we need to do a full ROS2 training uh, while still offering ROS training and potentially considering making that just available on the cloud. Uh, we're very excited about both participating in workshops and having the opportunity to create another workshop. As some of you may have heard, uh, ROSCON is splitting off on its own, separate from IROS, uh, and so different organizations are being offered opportunities to put on workshops in conjunction, so we're looking at that as well as collaborating with the ARM Institute on a ROS2 and DDS workshop uh, in Pittsburgh, right, so to get up on the East Coast. The other thing is, is uh, a lot of work, kudos to our team and, and Levi Armstrong if you have questions about Q the ROS plugin for uh, QT Creator and now with ROS2 support. Um, Levi may be touching on that today, not sure, but he's here, he's available, you can ask him about that. But these are sort of developer tools that again, we try to make, make ROS more accessible. Uh, this is obviously a little bit more facing the developer community, but obviously um, it's a valuable resource and one of the more trafficked uh, repositories in the ROS industrial ecosystem. <clears throat> and again, I touched on the offline planner, uh, and this is just another uh, example of that. <clears throat> So uh, as we talk a little bit about how we collaborate and work together, one of the things we created recently with the help of Open Robotics was a member-only forum. Um, so you'll notice um, both we have a Ross Industrial topic over at Ross Discourse. This is a great way to engage with the broader Ross Industrial community as well as the Ross community. So if you haven't checked out Ross Discourse, it's a great resource. If you have questions about what's the, what are the developments, what's going on in Ross 2, what's going on in Autonomous Navigation, NAV 2, Ross Discourse is a stop. Obviously, we have a, we're happy to have a category both for Ross Industrial as well as a member forum. So feel free to check those out if you have questions. Um, also, we're doing a lot of different, uh, bringing back quarterly meetings. These had kind of waned. So we brought back the idea of the quarterly meeting. It's a chance for all of the members to get together and get, have other members present what they're working on. So recently we had uh, Intel present their work on supporting NAV2 at the time. Uh, the Rosen Initiative presented the team that was working on Rothweld. Uh, presented some work as well as the different consortium regional updates. Uh, we're also um, considering basically revamping and we've gotten a lot of feedback for how we refresh our focus technical project process. And that includes basically considering smaller scope projects. Can we do FTP sprints? What are some other things to enable us to more effectively collaborate with our tech partners who aren't necessarily so used to the why does it take six months to spin up a project and get through legal, right? So what are some things we can do that would be more efficient? Um, one of the things also, we, 
turns into capability. So when you, the membership, interact, provide feedback, submit issues, um, you know, provide feedback on pull requests, it leads itself into capability, right? So Levi will touch on a number of these uh, as he follows me, but um, needless to say, we, we are constantly open sourcing new capability. We want to make sure that if you are looking for or have needs, you know where to find them in the repository. So if there are questions, again, you can always reach out. I'm always happy to be the, uh, the, the main stop, but of course all of our forums are very helpful as well. If you have a certain application and say, for instance, like, oh, this quantitative reach analysis tool would be really helpful for me as I design my system, we can help you get up and going. Um, and that, that tool is out there. <clears throat> So again, as I noted, right, the initiative of the consortium is really important because it enables us to work together to be more efficient in getting things done. Um, this is actually a, a snapshot from the work we did with NIST and actually bringing that system together. So still, like when we talk about opportunities for improvement and how do we really get something done, in the end, we need to get our hands dirty. We need to go and actually get the software running, integrate with, let's just say, in certain cases, proprietary solutions. But obviously these we pulled together and we can really get something done. This project came together into a real functional demonstration in a matter of three months. Um, obviously, it's been great to work with a number of different organizations. We actively work, I mentioned, with Open Robotics, the Move It community here in uh, the Consortium of Americas. We have a maintainer that participates in the Move It group. <clears throat> Again, we're both supporting and trying to set up more workshops to give a little more hands-on exposure to what's going on. I think a big initiative right now that's really fore in the mind is how do we scale training, right? So as we got into the summer, China was starting to announce their summer camp, right, as we get close, right? Over the last four years, they've put 1,500 people through rock training, right? So how do we scale? Right now, 50 people per year is a good year for us, right? So we're far from 1,500. <laughs> um, Europe has similar goals. They're looking for means to scale their training. So I look forward to collaborating with our members on means to do that. We've had some interesting conversations with a couple of the members about, hey, what can we do to scale training? Can we get it on the cloud, right? Can we make it more accessible? And so that's definitely a real area of opportunity. <clears throat> Again, the project, when we talk with industrial end users, we do want to create applications. We do look forward to grab and go capability. We focus on the building blocks to enable you to innovate, right? So you have the pieces to build the application to build your IP. Right, so some of these, again, we are focusing on the, to, to get some of the core building blocks to the point where you can pull them in and use them with relatively simple steps, not necessarily having to do um, a ton of integration time or refactoring to get your, your stuff working. Uh, at some point for certain applications, we are getting to the point where we're looking for non-expert application setup, right, and enable solution developer and end user value. Right, so what I mean by solution developer, that's our integrator. There's a number of integrator partners that are gonna be here this week. We appreciate you, we need you. When I was at Caterpillar, I could develop all the cool raw space applications I wanted. If there wasn't an integrator who was willing to work with a site to actually deploy it in production, it wasn't gonna go anywhere, right? And that's, that's, that's that piece, right? So we need to incentivize our integrator solution developer capability to embrace these tools. <clears throat> and again, um, I'm pretty excited to break down um, to see what we can do to actually break down barriers to enable more efficient project launch. So this is a little bit more around our FTP process. And then obviously enable you to develop the IP you're looking for. And then how do we work around the world? <clears throat> so as I noted, every member contributes to this vision. So we're gonna have some time tomorrow for those members who are staying um, and to actually sit there and spitball on the, and identify some gaps we need to work on, and ideally we'll come up with some plans to work together. We'll continue, obviously, to refine the repository based on your feedback, as well as like, hey, we can work with other organizations and, and maybe the right home is in another repository, that's fine, right? But let's make sure we know where the building blocks are and continue to grow this community. So thank you. Um, here's a number of resources. I'm sorry, uh, in this particular background, they're not very legible, but that being said, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you for coming, and with that, uh, Levi Armstrong. I guess I can handle a question or two if we have one. I don't know where we are in time. No, I'm checking. Oh, great. Are there any questions for me? Excellent. <clears throat> Levi? Sure, Roger. So I know Bastion is pretty raw. 
Well, that's great. So uh, for this particular event this week, we had we were approached by three. Uh, sorry, uh, Roger Christian of Yaskawa Motoman uh, asked how many integrators are engaged um, or getting in, engaged with, with Ross. And so for this particular event, we have um, three integrator registrants who we're happy to, to welcome uh, and a couple others that, are, that do integration services. So, and of course, obviously, for a number of the different applications, we're collaborating with people directly. They are working, bringing an integrator along, and those integrators are trying to develop the resources to act actively support ROS deployed systems. And so the question we have is, how do we help the integrators maintain that talent pool to support this type of system? Right? It's a little bit different than having a PLC expert, right? having somebody that's savvy in, like, say, C++ and what distribution and managing versioning between like the variations of PCL, et cetera, et cetera, right? So as we talk about the ease of use and, and some of these things, right, we need that feedback from that integrator community to make it sustainable. <clears throat> That's a great question. Thank you, Roger.